Now on BBC One, a shocking tragedy that proved to be a wake-up call for sleepy Britain, remembering the horror of the Hungerford Massacre. On a summer's day in 1987, a quiet English town became the victim of a one-man killing spree. Scenes in this film reconstruct events based on the eyewitness accounts of those involved. Their testimony is real, and the calls to the emergency services were actually made on the day. The driver is a regular, always stopping at the same pump and putting exactly the same amount of petrol into his car. Ian George is at the other pump. Someone pulled in behind me and sort of exchanged smiles. And then he went to the back of the car. And I just slowly sort of togged up and got ready to go. The driver of the Astra is waiting for Ian to leave. I heard a, a loud bang from behind me, so I looked back over my left shoulder. I guessed it was an armed robbery. I needed to call the police. It was only afterwards I realised how frightened I must have actually been at that point. No one else is aware of the real drama that is about to unfold. This is the start of the worst massacre in England. Thirty miles away from the petrol station, the police canteen in Newbury is serving lunch. PC Jim Wood and PC Roger Brereton always travel together in their Blues and Twos traffic car. Today would be different. He was a good mate. We used to socialise a lot. I knew his, uh, his, his wife and his boys very well. The gunman doesn't realise that the magazine of his rifle has fallen off. There is only one bullet in the chamber and he's fired it. Hello, I believe there may be an armed robbery going on at the Alf station between Foxford and Marlborough. OK, what's your name, please? Ian George. I felt that if I could get to the police quick enough, then if they approached it at both ends, they could probably, um, he wouldn't get away. But Ian George's call comes too late. The gunman has left the petrol station and is now driving towards Hungerford. The call is relayed to Newbury Police Station. Jim, got a call there, Dan. What we got? Uh, got arm robbery at the uh, Foxfield at the old petrol station. Hang on. Come on. I need this file call. I, I sorted out the file that the chap wanted. Roger said, I'll go in one car and you can follow along in, in, in the other. Roger Brereton and Jim Wood are told to find and intercept the Silver Astra. What they don't know is that this is much more serious than an armed robbery. The gunman is just two minutes away from the centre of the small Berkshire market town. In the residential area of Southview, it's quiet. Julie Jackson has finished work for the day. I got to the corner here and uh, I met one person that I know. We stood and had to chatter and with that, Michael Ryan 
came up round the corner. We knew he liked his fast cars, but not to drive the speed he was driving that day. It didn't seem to be his thing. Julie Jackson knows the driver well. It's Michael Ryan, who lives with his widowed mother, Dorothy, at number four. I knew Michael. He used to come into the house and, well, I was friends with my um, eldest boy. He was bullied, and instead of facing up to the bullying, he would back off. And so, therefore, he really did become a bit of a recluse like that. He didn't associate with too many children at all. If you look at the, the people who've been involved in similar kind of tragedies, then, then they do seem to have some characteristics in common with Michael. They, they tend to be loners, they tend to be underachievers, they tend to be people who develop an interest in fantasy because it seems an easier way of trying to establish a position for yourself. Michael Ryan's passion in life is guns, and he belongs to two gun clubs. All his weapons are licensed and legal. He's never been in trouble with the police. Consultant psychiatrist Richard Badcock has analysed Michael Ryan's behaviour on the day. People have wondered if the car had started, um, whether events would have taken a different course. It's very unlikely that he would have done anything substantially different. It's possible that different people would have been shot. But the, the general course of events, I think, would have still have been the same. Ryan is setting out deliberately to kill. He is heavily armed with a Kalashnikov, an automatic rifle, and a Beretta pistol. Two doors down, Roland and Sheila Mason are in their garden. Julie Jackson hears the shots that kill her neighbours, but thinks Michael is only playing around with an air rifle. I got up by the house of Michael Ryan's, stared at me actually, as he got out of the car. Can't describe the look he had on his face. A look of madness. Ryan is stalking Julie Jackson, but instead of shooting her dead, he fires at the ground. Well, I decided I'd move a bit quicker. I thought, well, if he's got air right out here, I don't want, want to know anything about it. I turned quite quick and went in round the side of the house and into the house. And I looked out the window and there was Michael Ryan shooting everything he could find up the lane. I thought he was intending to kill most of his neighbours. He chose neighbours as a group. I don't think he had sort of individual grudges. I think it was a general sense of, of frustration and anger and contempt for the ordinary life around him that he wasn't part of. As Ryan arrives at number 13, he aims at two teenage girls. Only one of them escapes. Hello, can I have an ambulance, please? I can't tell you what the problem is, but there's an awful lot of blood. The BT operator puts the call through to Newbury Police. Because the system's so old, there are only two 999 lines into the police switchboard. Today, it's going to be pushed beyond its limit.
Back in Southview, Julie Jackson has once more become a target. This time, Michael Ryan intends to kill her. You know, you must have seen the shadow of me moving in the house. The glass was going out of my window, shattering and holes in the wall and in the ceiling. Burning pain. Yeah, obviously I knew that I'd been shot in the back. I mean, it was the lower part of the back I was shot in. The police and ambulance service are both alerted by the BT exchange. As it was school holidays, we thought it may have been something to do with, with children playing with a gun, with an air rifle or something like that. All, all that we thought we were responding to was an isolated, simple shooting incident, nothing more than that. Adrian Coggins and Derek Whiting don't know there's a gunman with a lethal weapon on the loose. They are now heading directly into the danger zone. Newbury police pass the information on to Police HQ in Kidlington, who radio Jim Wood and Roger Brereton. Roger was in the car in front of me, probably about two or three miles ahead of me, just on the outskirts of Newbury. And the call come up saying that um, there's a bloke been seen walking down Southview in Hungerford with what was reported to be a rifle and could possibly be connected with the incident at Froxhill service station. Even though both reports mention a weapon, they still think this could be an everyday incident. Because of the new amount of shooting, the pheasant shoots, vermin shoots, etc., um, it didn't really strike as odd that someone would have reported seeing someone walking in a road in Hungerford with, with, a, uh, with a gun. I mean, I rightly or wrongly assumed it, and, and, uh, it was a shotgun. In fact, the gunman is carrying deadly assault weapons whose bullets can penetrate a brick wall from half a mile. In 1987, 8,000 semi-automatic weapons are legally owned in Britain. Asked to talk direct to Roger in his car, you know your area, and so you, you know your best plan of attack. And on this occasion, it was obvious that we needed to contain both ends of the road. The officers know that Southview is a cul-de-sac, with a path at one end leading onto Hungerford Common. Jim Wood agrees to cut across the common. Roger Britton approaches Southview from the main road. I was bleeding badly. I managed to crawl to the telephone, which was in the same room that I happened to be in. This time, Julie Jackson manages to call her husband, Ivor. While she is on the phone, Ryan runs back along the path to the common. As Ken Clements walks down the path, he's warned by his neighbour, Ray Morley, that someone is shooting. But he thinks there must be an innocent explanation. Police emergency. There's somebody firing a gun up the road. Yeah. And I've seen women run down the road screaming. It's <laughs> For the men on the Newbury switchboard, the scale of the disaster is becoming apparent. But there are so many calls coming in, it takes time to get the information up to Police HQ. Police emergency. This was just of huge proportions of the number of people trying to make 999 calls. You know, so many of them all at once. And when the calls are coming so fast, um, you can just imagine trying to handle that. Uh, 
this is the second time in the last two minutes. Could I have the police? Bear with us. As Roger Britton drives towards Southview, Michael Ryan heads back from the common. PC Brereton's radio picks up a warning from headquarters. It comes too late. But he does manage to call for help. As I started driving up this bit, uh, that's when I heard Roger call up a couple of times and say that he'd actually been shot. So I called up uh, to the control room and said, can you call him and uh, confirm? I tried calling him several times and there was no response. We couldn't make contact with him. So I was very, very anxious. And that's when I first heard the gunshots. Just flashed through my mind momentarily. It just sounded like uh, what you used to hear on the news at Beirut when they were discharging the weapons. First thing I saw was the body of Mr. Clements lying about 10, 15 feet up the alley um, with quite a severe chest wound. Uh, and the young lad with him, which turned out to be his son. Uh, and then as I looked further down, down the footpath there, I, I could see Roger's car parked further down in, in, on the road in Southview. And as, as I watched, uh, I could see the guy there with his uh, camouflage suit on. And he got a a handgun and he was firing, walking around the, the, the patrol car, firing into it. Ryan systematically empties both the Kalashnikov and his Beretta pistol into the police car. He fires a total of 23 bullets. I don't know how to describe it really, just disbelief. I suppose a little bit of terror. You know, I don't think, in all honesty, since that day, a, a day goes past when sometime or other you don't think about it, reflect on it and think, could I have done something different? And I lost a good friend here, very good friend. But, uh, that was the day, wasn't it? That was circumstances of the day. Jim Wood calls for full armed backup. It's routed to police headquarters in Kidlington, 40 miles away. We've now got a report of at least one person shot dead, maybe more. Um, and I think it may be at that point that uh, he mentions something about a police officer. We don't know, really know, but, um, and I'm thinking, oh dear, this is, this is serious stuff. Assistant Chief Constable Charles Pollard takes command of the incident. He needs to get to the scene as soon as possible. My responsibility is to be the person who authorises the use of police actually having guns to go there and to deal with the situation and to take responsibility for whatever happens. But unfortunately, he discovers his tactical firearms squad are on a routine training exercise in Otmore, 45 miles away from Hungerford. We're on board. That's it, guys. We're on. Yeah. Hungerford is one of the most remote towns in the Thames Valley Police Area. Today, the tactical firearms team are at least an hour away. Charles Pollard monitors the police radio for more information on the gunman. So you're picking up bits and pieces and trying to make sense of it. And it's never with great clarity, but what was very clear was a police officer has been shot dead. That's very serious. That other people, at that time we thought perhaps just two or three others had been shot, probably killed. That we don't know who's done this, but it's someone um, with, with a rifle and maybe other guns. That, that person is on the loose, but we've got no firearms people to respond to them anyway. So it's a, it's a very, very frightening scenario to be going into. 
Unknown to Charles Pollard, there is armed help closer at hand. Police weapons instructor Ernest Holloway was also listening in on the police radio when he heard Roger Breerton's call for help. And then I heard Roger, 10-9, 10-9, I've been shot. They were his exact words. I mean, if it had been a complete stranger, it wouldn't have hit so hard. But Roger said he'd been a neighbour and a friend. Yes, it was a shock. And my immediate reaction then was, get down there. Ryan started walking down the alley towards us. Uh, and he stopped and we sort of made, made eye contact. To see him now, see him walking down there now, yeah. PC Jim Wood now becomes a target himself. And he lifted up his Kalashnikov to the waist and just fired it towards us. He's incredibly lucky. Ryan's Kalashnikov is lethal at 300 yards. Just like bees buzzing past you, either side of you. Then it sort of hit home. Christ, this bloke's firing at me. Time to go, Todd. So we got in the car. Despite the risk, Jim Wood drives across the common to warn some families who are picnicking that their lives are in danger. And I could see in me, in me wing mirrors, I went across the common, uh, right and going right up the hedge line into that corner. I was sort of keeping an eye back the other way to see where Ryan was and whether he was holed up in the hedge or gone through, I don't know. I decided that we needed to set up a roadblock to stop any other vehicles coming onto the common. But Ryan is not taking cover in the hedge. After firing at the police car, he moves off. The chance to contain the gunman slips away. The police roadblock stops cars getting onto the common, but the streets at the front end of Southview still allow access to traffic. It leaves the way open for more cars to drive into the line of fire. My sort of initial thought, and I think probably my mum's initial thought, was that he was something to do with the police car. The bullets came through the bonnet of the car and into me it, there in my thigh. He then moved over to that side of the vehicle towards my mum. She was just completely covered from head to toe in glass and she'd been shot in the left shoulder. It was just such an intense, sharp, burning sensation. I think the ammunition that he was using had run out on us, so Mum put the car in reverse and we rolled backwards down Southview. Even though Alison Chapman is bleeding heavily and their car is in serious trouble, they escape before Ryan reloads. Um, this was the people that were hit in the car, but the lady drove off. But there was a, her daughter beside her was lying actually on the seat. Yeah, OK, thank you. Out has also gone to a local ambulance crew. As they reverse into Southview, Ryan is waiting. Ambulance control. Hello, it's Trouble One. Sorry, I've been shot. Where are you at the moment? We're on scene at Southview. All right, Hazel, we're getting somebody down. For God's sake, all I'm worried about is don't let 211 anywhere near the scene. 211 is the ambulance from Newbury. We were told that we were second crew. Um, my colleagues were already there on scene in Southview. They looked like there was a house on fire or something was on fire. It, it, it seemed more serious than what it was from the initial call we were getting. 
obviously we didn't have mobile phones at that stage or anything else. We had to rely on the radios in the ambulances. But the nearer we got to Hungerford, the worse radio reception became. Because of the telephone congestion, the warning from their colleagues isn't passed on. Ryan's mother, Dorothy, is also driving towards Southview on her way back from a job interview. Events like this never arrive out of the blue. Something would have happened immediately before the event. It might have been his mother going for a job interview because that would have changed the relationship between them. Julie Jackson's husband, Ivor, is minutes away. We got to the corner and I said, stop here. I said, I'll walk up. He said, no, I drove straight up there. All hell let loose. A bullet was coming in from the left-hand side of the car, which I was in. That's why I said, I'm lucky to be alive. And I must have had a ricochet off of something to come back into my ear, because they was coming in that way, and they went in that right ear. It was frightening. You just sit there and shake, don't you? You try to curl down as best you can and get out of it, but you couldn't. And that was it. As Dorothy Ryan reaches the bottom of her road, her neighbour, Mr Noon, flags her down. Stop! 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 Run! Wait! But she accelerates past him. Her son is expecting her. She doted on Michael, and I think she tried to give him everything that he wanted. But the fantasies that, that Michael developed, things like Michael being engaged, or the, the story that there was a rich colonel who had taken a personal interest in Michael, he probably cast them so as to make his mother feel better um, about him. And of course, once you, you embark on that, it, it, it gets quite difficult to get out of. And not necessarily a tragedy is waiting, but something is waiting. You know, some sort of crisis is going to develop. Ten miles away in Savanac Forest, Myra Rose is unaware of what's been happening in Hungerford. I just sat down with a book and uh, these two little kids came along. And they told me I'm Hannah and this is my brother James and he's two and I'm four. They said, man in black killed my mummy. <laughs> and we're going home. I know where I live. It's the house with the blue door. Now, you know, what do you do when the kid says that to you? There's one thing I know. I knew I wasn't going to let them go, and I had one in each hand. It seemed such a horrendous story. It didn't seem true. And I thought that they were playing hide-and-seek with their mother, that's what I thought. I took them back to a, a party who were picnicking, and we stayed there until the uh, policewomen came along. Police from the Wiltshire force find an abandoned car. The children's mother is discovered 30 yards away. She's been fatally shot. Now there are two manhunts underway by Thames Valley and Wiltshire Police. They have no idea they are pursuing the same suspect. When Michael Ryan stopped at the petrol station, he was on his way back from Savanac Forest. The choice of a, a young lady who was enjoying family life, I think that was, that was deliberate. He was trying to get back at life for robbing him of the, the chance of having similar relationship himself. The assistant chief constable is still half an hour away from Hungerford. Headquarters pass on some disturbing information. 
Because his guns were legal, ironically, we can find out what he's got. Now, in one sense, to know what he got was frightening. I mean, I didn't actually know myself, I think, that the implications of our firearms legislation at the time was such that someone could have such a lethal weapon as a Kalashnikov. So it's nice to know, but wow, frightening. The man in charge of the operation now knows who the gunman is and what weapons he's carrying. But he still doesn't know where the gunman has gone. I was still conscious at the time, and then Mrs. Ryan came walking up the road, and she said, Oh, not you as well, Ivor. Because she couldn't do a lot for me. And then went on the road and... Michael! Michael, stop it! I heard a shout at Michael, tell him to stop it. But um, obviously he'd done so much damage then that he just turned on her. She got as far as our drive, and the bullet started flying again, and I see Mr. Ryan fall. I don't think myself that he planned to shoot his mother, the, although it, when she turned up on the scene, he didn't hesitate uh, before shooting her. All the things that were important to him, he shot and destroyed. Killing his mother slows the pace of the shootings. Ryan moves away from the built-up housing area and onto the playing fields. He chose that route deliberately, and I think that was probably part of a process of calming himself down. The tactical firearms team is still more than 35 miles away, and Ryan is now moving towards the playground and open-air swimming pool. It's the summer holidays, and about 20 children are playing outside. Dean Lavisher is one of them. The first thing that I knew about it was uh, noticing the gentleman walking through the, the, the entrance, and. Uh, seeing like the dust marks around by his feet, like puffs of dust. Of course, the first thing I thought was some kids were throwing bangers. All of a sudden, he went down on his, on his side. The pathway just filled up instantly with blood. Uh, and we, you know, subconsciously, you know, something's not right. Uh, I suppose we sort of stayed we felt reasonably safe up this slide because it was, it, it, you know, had bars around the top of it, so we felt safe up there. The first we knew of uh, Ryan was when we sort of saw his feet appear beneath the branches. So we got a slow view of him, that with feet, legs, with the rifles in both arms. He had a very blank look about him, as though he'd done that sort of thing every day. So I got halfway down the slide and just leapt over the side, landed on one foot, and that was it. It was like a, a stampede then. It was like everyone bolting for my house, except I was the slowest. <laughs> I was at the back. I saw Ryan just shoot it at point-blank range, and that was just a glance to my left as I was going past very quickly. Ken Hall lives in the house next to the swimming pool. I could see Ryan walking down with a gun on his shoulder. I didn't say anything to him because, no, I, I guess I was possibly scared. Ken can also see the local taxi driver, Marcus Barnard, on his way to pick up a fare. As he came down in his taxi, I looked at Ryan and Ryan up with his gun. 
and put five or six shots into Marcus's car. I was thinking this is unreal. This can't be happening in Hungerford. It just can't be. I then saw Ryan. This is what always gets me. I could see Ryan then take the gun down, look at it, and he had a look of... It was a frown, I can recall that. A look of disbelief. I can see that. It was either the gun had jammed, he ran out of bullets, or what the heck am I doing? And with that, he literally threw the gun down. And I got to about here, and then Ryan turned round quite quickly, and as he did, I saw he had a pistol in his right hand. He fired two shots at me, missed, and with that, I mean, I was like this, I turned and back into the pool area. I was in the window there, and I could see all the way down the driveway. And as Ken was coming back this way, I saw the bloke with the gun. He turned and went back and picked the gun up. I was scared of a scream at him to get back indoors. I could see Liz in the bedroom, and I was literally screaming, get an ambulance, get the doctor, get the nurses get someone to help. Ambulances have been called in response to the 999 calls. One of them slips through the police cordon. As we turned the corner, we could see a police car about 50 metres in front of us with all of its windows shot out. There was another car which was crashed into the side of it. And at that stage, it really hit us, the, the seriousness of the incident. We could hear gunshots. They were all coming from the right-hand side. It was like a loud cracking sound. I walked round this side of the police car, um, leant in through the driver's window to check for a pulse, but the policeman was dead. The poor chap was still clutching the microphone at the time. I looked at the, the, the car beside me, which had two casualties in it, two, two men in it. Um, one was the driver, but he was dead. He'd been shot quite a number of times. I switched the engine off of the car and looked across to the passenger. I thought he was dead. He'd been shot in the head and the chest. Walked around the car and checked him for a pulse. And at that moment, he woke up. Well, I thought I was gone, to be honest. I'd nearly give up hope. Well, I'd give up hope, I think. You thought I was dead, but I wasn't. She saved my life. Well, I thank him for that. There was a lady laid here. She had been shot quite a number of times. She, she was dead also. It was Dorothy Ryan. There were two more people that had been shot in one of the houses in front of us. One was a young girl, the other was a woman. Uh, the girl had been shot in the legs, um, the woman had been shot in the back. The sight I see actually as I was going out to the ambulance was horrific. It was just like a war zone. I mean, the quiet place where we were living, you don't, want, you don't expect to see bodies around that we see that day. The only person who can stop the gunman now is another armed man. Ernest Holloway heads for Jim Wood's rendezvous point on the common. I heard five shots, very fast shot, bang, 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 bang. It was obviously a high-powered rifle. 
He now knows what he's up against. From there, any reasonable rifle shot could have dropped us easily. His own high-powered sniping rifle is a match for Ryan's Kalashnikov, but it's locked in a cupboard in Newbury Police Station. Getting it released will take time. It gave me a lot of frustration because my sole aim was to try to stop him shooting and killing people. Um, and I just didn't have the wherewithal to do it. Nine people are dead, including Ernest's friend and colleague, Roger Brereton. But Ernest Holloway is trapped on the common. All he can do is wait for the helicopter to help him pinpoint the gunman. Unfortunately, the helicopter is in for repairs. While he waits, the gunman is stalking the maze of streets on the other side of the common. One family has avoided the police cordon at the bottom end of the high street. Kidlington HQ has drafted in officers from outside the area to man the roadblocks. They don't realize that anyone with local knowledge knows the shortcuts that will allow them to double back into the housing estate. Anyone who takes that shortcut today risks their life. At the far end of Hungerford High Street, Carl Harries is shopping. I was on leave from the army, and then my car needed some work doing it. I was walking to get the parts from the car shop. It was just an ordinary day. There was nothing different about it at all. A car has driven past the roadblock at the bottom of the high street and is taking the back route into the housing estate. Ryan is cutting down a nearby alley, shooting as he goes. Most people in the high street mistake the bursts of gunfire for fireworks, but Carl Harries knows better. Trained in weapons by the army, he recognizes an automatic rifle. As I got closer, I could quite clearly see that he had a pistol in his hand and he had a gun over his shoulder. He turned around and he pointed the gun up towards the two houses here. And at this stage then, I thought, you know, there's, there's something obviously wrong. I remember backing into the hedge and just sort of staying there. Everything went completely silent. Okay, there was no noise, there was nothing. And I, and I don't know how long that was for. It, it, you know, it seemed ages and then my heart was going like mad and everything. Sandra Hill is now driving straight towards Ryan. There's somebody just down the road with a gun shooting at the junction of Priory Road and Salisbury Road. Charles Pollard finally arrives in Hungerford. I'm just remembering the, the, the ball of ice in my stomach as we're arriving in this small town with what we knew at the time. We went straight to Hungerford Police Station to find that, first of all, it was all being renovated. Uh, my job is to try and set up a full control point in this police station. So we've got one room at the back, hopeless, it's full of people. Uh, just two telephones, so I've got to commandeer a phone. The lifeblood of any operation like this is the communications. And normally you need about three or four different communications channels to deal with the huge amount of traffic. You need a command channel, you need an operations channel for your traffic cars and the people in the cordons. Uh, other, probably another channel for the local offices. You certainly need... Um, the capacity to, to, for people to talk together. You know things are happening, you know you're supposed to be in charge, and you just haven't got any information. You just haven't got a handle on what's happening. It's really, yeah, it's really pretty desperate. The police helicopter has been rushed out of the repair bay. I don't even really think the helicopter repairs have been completed. The helicopter pilot, so myself, has taken quite a risk. The idea was that if we spotted Ryan, they could put me down at a safe spot and direct me to where he might be so that I could go and try and deal with it. That was the plan. 
Ernest Holloway is still only armed with his short-range weapon, but is prepared to risk his life and take a shot at Ryan. Even though he knows Ryan's Kalashnikov could down the helicopter from 300 yards. Just when he's desperate for an accurate sighting on Ryan's position, the communications confusion reaches a critical point. You know, we were going from one side of Hungerford to the other. So many different reports. If somebody was saying he's outside my door now, by the time they got through on the 999 system and that got through to headquarters and that got through then on the radio to us, completely out of date. So basically we didn't have a clue where he was. Even though the police marksman can't see the gunman, Brian's response to the helicopter is chilling. <laughs> Further down Priory Road, Carl Harry's finds Sandra Hill. We, we carried a cross later on the grass. It's obvious from her injuries that she wasn't, you know, she wasn't going to, to make it. Um, it. And there's a house just over here, and I remember two old people coming out, and the lady gave me a, a small plastic-type car first aid kit, you know. I remember thinking to myself, well, you know, this is no, this is no good here, but thanks ever so much. Well, the lorry came flying down the road um, like mad and pulled up. And I said, what's going on? And he said, you know, it's all hell when let us up there, someone's shooting. I decided to go up there and have a look, you know, and if I could help, I could help. But Carl Harries has no idea what is ahead of him. Ernest Holloway's sniping rifle has arrived. He now has a weapon to match Michael Ryan's. My shooting ability against him, I would have backed myself 100 times out of 100. This might sound boasting, but I have never found anybody that could they shoot me. But he still has no location for the gunman. All he can do is comb the area. I'm wanting to see Ryan so we could put an end to it all. If he fired at us when we're in the helicopter, at least then, by law, I was entitled to fire back. While the marksman carries on searching, the wounded are desperate for medical attention. Any ambulance anywhere near any of the casualties, he is still firing indiscriminately. Carl Harris is still trying to save lives. He's told there may be casualties inside one of the houses. And as I came across to the house, okay, the door at the time was, it was a white frame door with ugh, complete glass in the middle. And I could see the whole of the glass had been shot away. And then I could hear somebody saying, you know, help, help. Not really loud, just nice and quiet. And I was saying, hello, hello. And trying to work out where they were. He's, if he's in there and I walk in there, I'm, I'm, I'm doomed to failure, basically. And it was unbelievable. It was something I'd never seen in my life. There was blood absolutely everywhere. There was this lady and her husband was basically laying across her. It was obvious to me that he was trying to protect his wife. I was starting to patch her up and she was just going on about her husband. And I said, no, he's fine, he's fine. And she was like, Jack, Jack. And I, in the end, I, said, well, I just, was just honest with her and said, look, he's gone. There's nothing you can do about him. Just worry about you. Yes, hello. We've got a, a male and a female badly shot up, OK, both of them. And your name, sir? Mr. C. Harry. Keep pressure on the wound if you can. There's loads of bleeding. There's too many of them, mate. I went outside. I remember saying, "Who's next?" You know, and it was—it was—it seemed to be like that. Who's next? Get the police up there, Cold Harbour Road, immediately. The channel gun is coming up from Holy Road. Nine separate reports of Ryan's location have been passed on to Charles Pollard. Police emergency. There's a madman in uh, Tarrantville with a gun. All the sightings conflict. It could be 20, 30 minutes before they've got through. What they're reporting may have also got distorted over time. They're frightened, so the report is often quite jumbled. Um, what you end up with is a, just a, a, 
a myriad of bits of information. Things were coming to a conclusion, so I think he was then looking for somewhere where he could make his last stand. At 2.15, the tactical firearms team arrive in Hungerford. Charles Pollard decides to focus on three areas. Hungerford Common, Southview, and the John O'Gaunt School. And it's a very slow process, very frustrating. We couldn't allow our firearms teams to walk through the streets because they'd be shot dead straight away from a, a sniper with a high-powered rifle. So this is unprecedented, uh, the, the, the slowness with which you can safely do anything. But you just had to be patient. The tactical team are ordered to within striking distance of the gunman. Ken and Liz Hall watch as a group of armed police make their way towards their house. We really did think that we were in danger. I remember the thing that went through my mind was the Iranian embassy siege, you know, when they jumped over the walls and that, it was that sort of thing. Terrible. If you're going to approach him, you've got to be incredibly careful how you do that, you just don't walk in. I mean, imagine the worst case scenario where we'd sent our firearms team and we'd lost half of them all shot dead. We then haven't even got a response team to deal with the, with the situation. As Ernest Holloway flies over the John O'Gorn school, he realizes he's being shot at. The shots are also heard by the men on the ground. I've confirmed visual. Confirmed visual. The sweetest news was the fact that we know it is one gunman, he is in the school, and we have him contained. You can then see the end, which is critical. Just after five o'clock, the police hear the gunman's voice for the first time. Mr. Ryan! Can you hear me? Yes. You're surrounded by armed police. Do exactly as you're told and you'll come to no harm. Do you understand? Yes. What weapons do you have with you, Mr. Ryan? One, uh, one nine millimeter pistol and ammunition. Their strategy is to talk Ryan out of the building without any more shots being fired. I also have a grenade. Mr. Ryan, do not come to the window with the grenade. Do you understand? Yes. Mr. Ryan, I want you to leave all your weapons in that room. Do you understand? My pistol's tied to my wrist with a lanyard. I have one round of ammunition. And what comes through is a sense of being lost, a sense of no. confusion, a sense of wondering himself what it was all about. I must know about my mother. I will try to find out about your mother. Just bear with me. She's dead, isn't she? That's why you won't tell me. I think I counted ten references to asking about his mother in, in tones of urgency, you know, demanding to know how she was. And yet clearly he knew she was dead. I didn't mean to kill her. It was a mistake. I don't think he was clear in, in his own mind why it was so important to him to make sure that she was dead once he'd shot her. Possibly it was an expression of the particular kind of closeness that he had with his mother. What are the casualty figures? I don't know. 
Obviously, you shot a lot of people. Hungerford must be a bit of a mess. Ryan's attack has left Hungerford in a state of devastation. It's funny how um, small things stick in your mind. I remember seeing um, a police officer with a tin of red paint uh, painting circles around the, the shells. Sixteen people are dead. Fifteen others are seriously wounded. The fire, started earlier by Michael Ryan, has destroyed his house and four others. For me, I thought that we completely screwed up because I just felt helpless for most of the afternoon. It's a bit like a nightmare. You just can't can't collect the information, you can't get get control to manage something. So I'm thinking, this has just been awful. Uh, my own part in this is terrible too. It's when I arrived the next day, and they told me what had happened because of the complete communications problems, and that I thought, actually we did okay. For those unlucky enough to have crossed Brian's path, there is a terrible price to pay. Jim Wood breaks the news to Roger's wife. It's be part of the police service. You take death messages to people and tell people that their sort of loved ones have died or whatever. But uh, that was just bloody awful. I left the police force because I was so angry that this had happened. It had been allowed to happen. We could do nothing about it at the time. A year later, I had a breakdown and I wanted to get away. Ivor Jackson has never returned to the home that he and Julie shared for 21 years. There was too much happened around my doorstep, I'm afraid. No, we couldn't go back there. We had some terrible times. But, I mean, we're together, that's the main thing. time is it? 6.45. What do you want to know the time for? I want to think about it. <laughs> Mr. Ryan! I think Britain grew up um, as a result of Hungerford in some ways. The realisation this could happen in the market town, in fun-loving England where we don't have guns, where the police aren't armed. That changed policing and, and, and in one sense it changed society forever.
If you've been affected by any of the issues in this program and would like to talk to someone in confidence for details of further support and information, please call the BBC Action Line on 0800 88 88 09. Lines are open seven days a week from 7.30am until midnight. All calls are free and confidential. She just hit me with her fist and um, just, just punched me across my face on my, on my cheek. Someone to watch over me after the news. This is BBC One in the Midlands. Now the news at 10 o'clock with Hugh Edwards and Shafali Oza. Hopes of a landmark deal between Northern Ireland's political leaders are fading tonight. The sticking point yet again is weapons decommissioning. As the IRA lets it be known, it's not prepared to be humiliated. The IRA will not, as I've said before, submit to a process of humiliation. We'll have the latest on the talks on the eve of a prime ministerial summit in Belfast. Also tonight, the BBC is to cut 3,000 jobs. The money saved will go into new programmes. Fishermen are warned, cut down the catches or stocks will collapse. And Arsenal are cruising through to the next stage of the Champions League. And here in the Midlands, a woman's arrested by police after a teenage girl was killed in a hit-and-run accident. And a new boss at Molyneux is Hoddle the man to take the wolves back up.